Welcome, Royal Family. We are in Matthew Lesson 48. And we're going to be talking about taking vows to our Lord, certainly directly to our Lord being very important. So vows to our Lord is the lesson of the day. I want to keep the folks in California in prayer. Again, a horrific shooting. Um, I don't want to get into any details. We just had the midterms. We had the shooting right afterwards. Um, interesting things happening with uh, Jeff Sessions and the midterms and then the shooting happened. So I have my own opinions about that. I'll probably doing a political commentary soon within the next maybe two to three days. So keep your eye open for that. It'll just be some basic stuff covering where we're at, where I believe we're going, uh, concerning our future as a country and the biblical connections to all that. Um, so, you know, tune in for that. I know you folks like that a lot, but my main job is as a pastor and a teacher. So uh, the Patriot, uh, the Patriot pastor teacher that does political commentary will be back. There is a new angel message I just did today. So please feel free to check my homepage. It is angels uh, number 11. and It has to do with demonic influences in the world and the fallen angels being connected to uh, the false gods of historical times. So I think that's an interesting study. That is on my homepage. I just did that this week. In fact, today I had that done and um, getting this one out as well. So those are my two lessons for the week. And probably by the weekend or towards the end of the weekend, I might do a political commentary and get back on track with my two Matthew Matthew messages again for next week. Again, we are in Lesson 48, Vows to Our Lord. Take a moment of silent prayer and keep those families in California with a horrific shooting in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we had to come to study your word. And Father, we're asking you to touch those families out there. And let your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be pro proclaimed in all this. Let those who do not believe in your Son come to believe, Father. Touch those families. Heal those families. Protect our government and our president, certainly, Father. And we're asking these things through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Lesson 48. Vows to our Lord. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is continuing to clarify. We're in Matthew chapter 5 in our study. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ continuing to clarify the Mosaic Law and how it has been fulfilled in His presence and what it means for the current generation of believers. That's what He's getting into in Matthew chapter 5, talking to the apostles, having that intense crash course of doctrine. We are in Matthew 5.32. Let's pick it up there and read it together. Matthew 5.32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, which means infidelity, cheating, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. We covered this last time. Um, I did two lessons on divorce and marriage, uh, so you should look at that. Matthew 5, 33. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Very important principle, Matthew 5, 34. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, verse 35, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, Matthew 5, 36, nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. You have no control over that. Matthew 5, 37, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil. And notice in verse 33 on the board, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has gone from the serious vow and commitment of marriage into vows and promises under the name of the Lord because they are one and the same. Marriage is on the eyes of the Lord, certainly for the believer, and it is a vow in front of the Lord. Now he's going on with vows in front of the Lord, what it means. And it was common, common Jewish practice, certainly under the leadership of the Pharisees in that day, to make vows and commitments in public and use the name of the Lord as a binding agreement. So that wasn't uncommon, it was actually very common, but there was an element of, do as I say, not as I do. You ever heard that? You ever heard that? Do as I say, not as I do. This is what's going on in this point in history, it goes on today as well, obviously. Do as I say, not as I do. The Lord Jesus Christ was warning of the vows and commitments demanded by Jewish leadership under the guise of being sincere, as they themselves were not always fulfilling the commitments. Not their commitments that they made as well. This was also a warning for any vow made to the Lord. As always, is that two or threefold uh, lesson in one scripture. So the Lord is giving a warning about vows and commitments demanded by Jewish leadership under the guise of being sincere 
as they themselves were not always fulfilling their own commitments. And also, this is a general warning of making a vow or a commitment in front of the Lord and toward the Lord saying, Lord, I will do this in your name. That's one of the, the uh, important principles here. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was just mentioning the serious vows of marriage, so he goes right into that, mentioning that serious vow of marriage made before God, and he's now going to the next level with this. The Pharisees would put a yoke, they would put a yoke, a strap or a harness, we would say, upon those underneath them, and they were certain to monitor or check in with those people to ensure guilt or shame if they failed. They put something on them, you need to be involved, you have to do this, you should do that, why aren't you doing this? And get the people to commit. They'd have used shame and guilt as a game. Get them to make commitments and vows. Yet they themselves had no one to supervise their own activity. Yet they were going around being spiritual police to everybody else. You see, the double standard with the Pharisees and scribes ran very, very deep. Double standard. Same thing with the Sadducees, actually. They were more politically connected and were much more secular-minded in their approach toward life. Yet they made vows and commitments and failed to follow through on them often as well. But... They would demand that the less fortunate underneath them live up to all the standards and promises that they made. So there was a double standard going on here. Jesus Christ was making everybody aware of that. Those people who hold you to a higher standard than even they can manage to sustain are steeped in legalism, we would say. It's entrenched in them, the legalism. And that arrogant standard is what makes them feel powerful and holy. You ever heard that term, holier than thou? That's how they get that feeling, being holier than thou. They put standards on other people or make sure they make other people aware that they're not living up to a standard. And, and that's the legalism in all of it. And they step back and say, yes, but I can live by that standard. I'm not as bad as they are. You know what I'm saying? That's that, that do what I say, not what I do kind of thing. Watching someone else fail and taking the focus off yourself makes the arrogant person feel more superior. Watching someone else fail or taking that focus off yourself it makes that arrogant person feel even more superior than they already do. It's all an illusion. I'm going to have you guys turn to Luke chapter 18. It's, it's very uh, sinister in its nature because it drops shame and guilt on a person. Nobody should do that. This lesson on vows and commandments needs to be a twofold message. First was what was happening during that point in history that I'm pointing out to you. Legalistic guilt and shame that the leadership of the Jews put upon on those under their authority and those who they looked down upon. And the other thing will be taking the name of the Lord in vain concerning a vow. Very serious infraction. So those two things are very important in this lesson today. We're going to look at Luke 18, verse 9. Luke 18, 9. And he also told this parable, Jesus, to some people who trusted in themselves. Look at that. 18, Luke 18, 9. Those people who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous. It's exactly what I'm talking about. And viewed others with contempt. Luke 18, 9, and in verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Luke 18, 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Isn't that nice? Isn't that a nice statement? Isn't that a legalistic statement? Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here, he's saying basically. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I, that I get. And I want you to notice in verse 12, what is it? Outward. Notice the outward is important to the legalist. The outward appearance is important to the legalist in verse 12. In verse 13, but the tax collector, the publican, who normally were, like I said, very connected to crooked and criminal behaviors and also looked down upon. The tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. That In the ancient world, that was really a, 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 a sign of... Uh, of um, um, like a sadness, it's a beating of the chest and putting the hand down. That was a sign of sadness and woe and sorrow within a person. The tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Acknowledging what? Sinner. Big. Big statement right there. Big acknowledgement. Luke 18, 14. I tell you, this man went to his house justified, Jesus Christ says, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself,
but he stood in the public. This was always, and oftentimes they would pray with the palms up and the hands up. And so people walking around, this, oh, he's deep in prayer, the Pharisee. These Jewish leaders loved the show. They loved the show. They loved the garments and the tassels and the outward look of being spiritual. They liked that outward look of being spiritual. Look at Luke 18, 11. What does he say? He assumes swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. Notice he's bunching, knows nothing about this tax collector. From all appearances, it doesn't even seem in this parable that he would know his name. But he assumes that he's some kind of liar, adulterer, cheat, stealer. Arrogance. Arrogance always assumes it knows every detail when it doesn't. It assumes it knows what others think and what others will do or what they have done. Arrogance, it assumes it knows better, therefore it should be the one in control. It should be in authority, it should have power. That's what arrogance is all about. That's what the mind of arrogance thinks about, and that's legalism. Remember, the Pharisees over overanalyzed. They overanalyzed and overstructuralized the Torah so much that they added hundreds, hundreds of extra details and laws to the core doctrines of the Mosaic Law. They were so concerned, so concerned with what everyone else was doing, how they could walk a spiritual walk closer to God, more so than everyone else around them. That was the big thing. How can I walk closer to God? How is my walk going to look in front of everybody else? How can I be the spiritual leader and look like the spiritual leader? That was their main concern. It was all arrogance. It was all arrogance, which is the evil sister of legalism. How's that? <laughs> They're one and the same. They're one and the same. 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is what the Lord thinks. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at this appearance. Right? Don't look at the appearance. Or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, but man looks at the outward, certainly the arrogant, those in the old sin nature. Outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. I always talk about your motivation, what's in your soul structure, what are you thinking? This was when Samuel was sent to choose David as a future king. Some of you know this story, but that's what was going on. All the brothers, all David's brothers are coming in front of him. And Samuel say, nope, not you, not you, nope, nope, God's not picking you. All David's brothers were physically stronger, physically healthier looking. They were older, all of them, probably more experienced in life. Yet, God wanted this skinny teenage sheep herder to be the future king of Israel. They didn't even think about bringing him in front of Samuel. You, you know, they're just thinking, uh, uh, Jesse's just thinking, bring all my other sons and put them all in front. This one's big and strong. This one's older. He's got life experience. They didn't care about David. He's out herding the sheep. The youngest one in the family, the skinny, scrawny little teenage boy, they're not going to worry about him, yet he's the king in God's eyes. For that matter, when we talk about kings, King Saul was chosen because he was tall and attractive. That's why. Tall and attractive. That's how they, they chose King Saul. Yet he was a weak believer. Israel picked somebody who was tall, good-looking, head and shoulders over everybody else, didn't know anything about his IQ or spiritual life. He was a weak believer who ended up dying the sin unto death, he failed as a king, King Saul. See, our human frailty always looks at the exterior. We always want to look at what's going on outside, how somebody looks, how they act in front of you, so you can make that quick judgment. Yet God could care less about our outside appearance or our failures or our standing out in the world. He could care less about that, our stature among other people. In fact, that often gets in the way. He chooses sometimes the least that you expect he surprises you. You're looking at one right here. The least that you expect. In Matthew chapter 5, the Lord is teaching his apostles his arrival. That his arrival, the age of the hypostatic union, we would say, is a pivotal point. It's a pivotal point where the, the hypocrisies all get exposed and his word becomes clarified as he ushers in a new church age, prepares them for this new age to come. Now, what many people lose sight of is the completed canon of scripture, the Bible, was not fully complete wasn't until John finished writing the book of Revelation. You know that. That's the last book in the Bible. In fact, completed copies of the Bible really didn't start circulating until after 95 AD, shortly after that, probably by 100 AD, to be more accurate concerning copies circulating around. Therefore, everything leading up to that point of the completion of the Bible was a form of building blocks and pieces of a larger puzzle coming together that would only fully come together after it was written. So we always have to keep that in mind. Now, back in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, 34, But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, verse 35, or by the earth, for that is his footstool, for his feet, and by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. 
You have heard the term, don't bite off more than you can chew? You ever heard that term? Don't bite off more than you can chew? Well, this is the modern way at looking at what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is warning his future teachers and leaders about right here. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Understand where you're at. Be mature enough. Grow up. Be ready. And then make your commitment. And then make your vow. Then open your mouth, as we would say. That's basically what he's saying in our layman's terms for nowadays. I can't tell you, folks, how many times someone has come into the church where I'm an associate pastor at and made promises and vows to get involved with one of the ministries. I don't care. we got several different ones. Different ministries, different aspects of the church. And within six months or two years, they're gone. Poof. Disappeared. But in the moment, the emotions get the best of them. They, they're on an emotional high, so they say, I want to do this, I want to get involved in it, I'll take care of that, don't worry about it, this will be taken care of. A couple of years later, they're gone. Much like people who fall in love. They fall in love too quickly, and most of it revolves around lust or not wanting to be alone sometimes is the feeling. And then they make a marriage commitment quickly that later on becomes a burden in their lives. And I suggest you go back and look at my two lessons on divorce because it has a lot of principles towards a right type of marriage in that as well. But that's what's going on here. Rash decisions, emotional decisions. Matthew 5, 36, Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. We have no control over our own bodies in the sense as to what will happen in the future. You don't. You have no idea if, if you're... Uh, two days from now, you're going to have an accident and you're going to be in a wheelchair. You don't know. You have no sense of that. You don't really know that. So how can we commit to vows we may not have control over later on? You need to think about that principle. This means step back and take time. Take a breath. Pray. Pray about your future plans. Figure things out. Don't be rash. Don't jump ahead of yourself. We're to make vows and commitments, especially in front of our Lord, and take it with a serious intent. You're absolutely supposed to do that when the time is right, but take it with a serious intent in your heart. Matthew 5.37, let your statement be what? Yes or yes? No? No. One or the other. Be definitive. That's what he's saying. This is definitive. Anything beyond this is, is of evil. For those in leadership, it is even more important to be strong in your convictions and commitments. And that's who he's addressing right now as well. So don't take this because you're not in a position of leadership right now, that it's not important. It is. But for those in leadership, he's really emphasizing the strength in this. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, no. That's it. Don't be fluctuating in between and don't get involved in making vows and commitments rashly with emotion and you cannot follow through with them. It shows a form of weakness and he's actually talking about a lifestyle of that kind of stuff. It is a form of evil after a period of time. We all fail. We all fail, we all fall from time to time, and we always have God's grace and mercy for all those times that we do fall. But do not be one of those people who in a moment of excitement you make a vow, and that later on it's impossible for you to fulfill it. And you kind of knew it from the beginning. You weren't serious about it. It was just felt good in the moment. You felt guilty, you didn't want to be in front of people and say, no, I can't do that. So you said, yes, I can. Or you felt excited in the moment. And you really don't have enough doctrine in you, but you felt the excitement, so you jumped. Be very careful. The key in all this is endurance. Really, the key about in all this when you're thinking about these things is endurance. I have to go through, and now I have to go through the difficult periods, the boring periods, the good times, the bad times, because I've committed. i got to get to the other side of this thing. Stick the commitment out. That's endurance. Having an attitude that you'll stand in the gap once you have committed to something. Having that attitude, you're going to stand there in it. The apostles are also being warned in all this that if you want an easy life, think again. He's kind of giving them a heads up. Jesus Christ, there's several scriptures in this lesson, if you haven't noticed recently in the last uh, five or six messages I've done on this. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is giving them a heads up. Things are going to be difficult, fellas. Wake up a little bit. Don't make the vow until you're ready. Don't make the vow until you're ready and certain. Be sure. Be ready. Be prepared. You ever heard that term? By the way, I warn any man wanting to be involved in a church, any form of leadership, especially deacons, pastors, evangelists, is that who you think you're being led? Be prepared. Be prepared. Make sure it's from God. Make sure it's not your hands in it. And be willing to stand in there when it's boring and it's slow and God doesn't seem to be responding to you and you have to just stand in there and do it. And when the difficulties come and the attacks come, and I guarantee they will, guarantee it. So think about that. We're going to go to James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1. There's something to think about. 
You, you, you want to be in a position of leadership, even outside the church. You want to be a husband, you're in a position of leadership. Better take it serious. Better be prepared for that marriage. You better have your own house in order and have your own life under control before you take on the life or responsibility of being over somebody else. James 1.1 1, 1. James, a bondservant of God, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. James 1, 2, consider it all joy, happiness, inner peace, my brethren, when what? When everything's going your way and you won the lottery? No, you encounter various trials. Find joy and peace in that. He's saying inner contentment in that. Why? Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. That's what you want. Verse 4, and let endurance have its perfect result. Let it work in you so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Very important to stand in there. Sometimes we step out and run away when, the, when we're just like right five steps away from the finish line and we run in the other direction. We don't even realize it. But let that endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. James 1.5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6, but he must ask in what? Faith. Faith. Confidence. Without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Because you really don't believe. You're going to go astray after you say something. You're going to go in the other direction as soon as it going gets tough. What do they say? The tough get going. They don't run away. James 1.7, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being double-minded man. Verse 8, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. James 1, 8, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That's what happens. Consider it all joy. Look at that verse on the board. When you encounter problems, how many of us have that outlook in life? I'm, hey, look, <laughs> we all fail. It's not easy. I'm not telling you it is. In fact, that attitude only comes when we're walking by means of the Spirit, applying doctrine in our lives. That's how it comes. A lot of people emotionally say, yeah, I'll be the one. I can do it. I can have that outlook. I'm going to have joy in, in this adversity until it happens. And then the adversity not only comes, but it sticks around for a while. And you can't see the other side of it. Then what's your attitude going to be? See, our spiritual endurance and strength come very, sim very similarly as physical endurance and strength. Both are attained in the same way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Both the physical and the mental. Excuse me, the physical and the spiritual. When it comes to endurance and strength, they're both attained in the same way. It's very similar. It is by exercise. What's exercise? Repetitive. Doing something over and over again. Setting the clock to, to, to go to the gym. Going to the gym. Doing the physical activity. Pushing yourselves. Having that mental attitude. By making purposeful, on purpose strides. Doing that same thing consistently over and over again. I thought about something, putting this message together. When I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama, at the end of the summer of 1980, I know, like prehistoric times, I was at a reception station in the Army at Fort McClellan, Alabama, for four or five days, right? That's where you first go. We got shots, we got haircuts, uniforms. We watched a film on the history of the United States Army. We learned about eat at the mess hall. We got in formation. They did a couple of drills. We met a drill sergeant or two that were floating around there. We got our soldier's manual, started studying them. We went to classes for Army protocol, all during the course of like four or five days. We got up early every morning that we were there. We did like 50 push-ups and 50 jumping jacks. We jogged a little over a mile. And I thought, this is no big deal. You know, I had a little bit of a background in martial arts, even though I was into all kinds of crazy other stuff as a teenager. Um, so I was kind of in good shape. But then a set of buses pulled up. And we all loaded ourselves into them. The new gear, the duffel bags, our little buzzed haircuts. We drove for about 15 minutes. The next thing I know, a big rugged drill sergeant jumped on the bus and he started shouting his name, his job, what his expectations were. All these instructions, he's shouting. We're all sitting there. On our buses and the bus behind us and the bus behind that full of guys had drill sergeants doing the same thing he then said you have one minute to dismount off this bus and get onto the painted line out there and on the tarmac and he said I just wasted 50 seconds of that minute and he got off the bus and you saw everybody scrambling pushing falling to get off and get on that line that's when it really began that's when it really began 
that's when I realized, okay, it's a little more than what we had at that reception station. Now for the next eight weeks and then the next eight weeks after that, because I had MOS school for eight weeks, which was a, uh, a military police academy. But the Army basic training, the eight weeks, one mile of jog in the first couple of days. I quickly turned into two miles a couple of days later. Next thing I know, you were up to three miles. And by the end of about four or five weeks, we're doing five miles pretty regularly every morning, along with all uh, sets and sets of mountain climbers and jumping jacks and duck walks with a, a log on our shoulders sometimes and obstacle courses, all kinds of stuff. But that's how strength and endurance become part of a lifestyle. That's how it becomes part of a lifestyle. Spirituality is the same thing, folks. It is. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You fail, you fall down, you get back up. Some days you have a good day, some days you don't. That's life. Consistency. Consistency is everything. Certainly with Bible, stu Bible study it is, too. So take it seriously. This is your time at the gym, believe it or not. I don't, I don't care what, what you believe, it is. Your spiritual muscle, you're developing it. We're going to finish with some principles as I normally do, so let's go over them. Vows and commitments are not designed to entrap us. That's not, you know, not with God anyway. They're designed to keep us, what, steadfast and on course. That's what they're designed for. They're designed for mature individuals with intestinal fortitude who understand that personal desire is usurped by duty and honor. It's taken over by duty and honor. It's taken a back seat by duty and honor. I'll let you take a moment to take a note on that slide. Very important principle. You should never be afraid of commitment, folks. Never. But you should be prepared for it. You should never be afraid of commitment, but you should be prepared for it. Without commitment, we have no definitive strength in our lives. We are weakened vessels and silly children when we constantly run from our responsibilities. Any responsibilities. If you know it's something you're supposed to do and you're afraid to take that vow or make that commitment or stand in that gap and do what's expected of you, you're going to constantly look for a shortcut. You're a weakened vessel. You're becoming like a silly little child. It leaves us in a state of weakness continually, very vulnerable to outside forces and agendas that will sway us in one way or another. They'll constantly be, I think this is the best way. I don't know if that's the best way to go. This might be the best way to go. In fact, we will never have a solid belief system in our life because we'll be open for the next new thing, the new idea, or the emotional wave that tickles us, tickles our fancy and makes us feel safe. So it actually leaves us in a state of weakness when we're like this, vulnerable to outside forces, outside agendas that can sway us over time, different directions. In fact, we will never have a solid belief system because we would be open for the next new idea or emotional wave that tickles our fancy or makes us feel safe. That's what a lot of people, they want to feel safe. They want to be comfortable. Those who seek comfort over commitment and personal desires over values will build a temple of worship to themselves deep within their soul structure and it will constantly call out for more dedication, more devotion. It won't go away. It'll get worse. Snowball going downhill. We become weaker and less able to problem solve and handle adversity when we're focused on ourselves, living in the old sin nature, always looking for the easy out, running in the opposite direction. Instead of standing in the gap and being problem solvers with the word of God and going to our Lord and looking for strength that way, we become weaker over time, not stronger. Laziness begets laziness, as the Bible teaches, and it is a vicious cycle. Commitments and vows in the spiritual sense are very serious. Very serious. Commitments in general are, but certainly in the spiritual sense, they should never be quickly thrown out, pushed to a side, not taken serious, or ignored, because the result will be discipline. It'll be discipline either in the form of reaping what you sow eventually down the road. Believe me, sometimes God can wait 8 or 10 years for things to catch up to you. Or divine discipline directly from God, which you don't want. Trust me. Neither one of them are good. What we promise to God is never taken lightly, folks. It is never taken lightly. Therefore, take your time and pray about what you promise to do concerning your spiritual walk. Think about it. Pray about it. Grow into it. Be prepared for it. Don't run from it. The mature believer is willing and excited to commit and make a vow for the Lord. The immature believer runs from the challenge and remains in the infant stages of spirituality resembling an unbeliever. There's almost no difference. There's almost no difference. The baby believer usually peels away eventually and they get lost out in the cosmic system at some point or another. They get lost in the shuffle of life and they're just caught up being almost like an unbeliever.
resembling an unbeliever. Now that mature believer realizes the serious nature of a vow, and they contemplate it. They contemplate it, they take it to the Lord in prayer, they pray about it, they prepare for it, prepare, and then they embrace it. That's what they do. That's what a, a spiritually mature believer will do. So you can take it for whatever you want. I don't know if you are, you are in the middle of a vow, you just took a vow, or you made a promise. But boy, if you put it in front of the Lord and you, and you brought it to the Lord, you better be serious about it. You better be serious about it. So every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Again, keep those folks in California in prayer. I'll be back real soon with a political commentary probably and a, uh, more Matthew lessons coming up. I could use support on a lot of different levels, so please take a note on uh, P.O. Box, the prbministries.org, the GoFundMe page. Uh, I, need the, I need all the support I can get. Get the messages out there. Share them, like them, uh, support this channel. Thank you so much. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time that we had, and we're asking to go forward in your plan, Father, and be the warriors and, and stand in the gap when the times get tough, Father, and give us that strength through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.